Epstein anomaly is primarily characterized by the apical displacement of the tricuspid valve leaflets. The anterior leaflet also has abnormal and thickened cordae, and the valve also rotates anteriorly closer towards the pulmonary valve. Assessment of the valve is obviously pretty important here, but what else do we need to know? First of all, Epstein anomaly is strongly associated with atrial septal defects, which can be an important cause of cyanosis, so it is important to assess the atrial septum very carefully. This patient with Epstein's has an atrial septal defect with bidirectional flow. It will flow right to left in systole when the right atrium fills with tricuspid regurgitation, and then in diastole will flow left to right as both atria fill with venous blood. Secondly, Let's take another look at this image, this time concentrate on the size of the chambers. The displacement of the valve causes a lot of the right ventricle to become atrialized or to function like a right atrium. All that atrial stretch can lead to arrhythmia. But how does all of that affect the right ventricle? Well, it actually looks pretty small. Maybe it's just a cut? Let's take a look in the short axis view. Ouch, it looks pretty small here too. Sometimes there might be right ventricular outflow obstruction due to the cordae obstructing the small right ventricular cavity. This is associated with a very early childhood presentation, sometimes in utero, and carries a poor prognosis. So particularly if there is tricuspid regurgitation, the little right ventricle has an awful lot of work to do, right? That's right, take a look at this case. Here we are looking at a severe form of Epstein, in the four-chamber view, it's very difficult to see the right ventricle at all. This patient has severe tricuspid regurgitation, so the right atrium is really overloaded. Here's the short axis view. The tricuspid annulus is almost touching the pulmonary valve. The right ventricle is so small, but it seems to be very dynamic. It's small, but powerful. This patient had some other tests and was found to be desaturating with exercise, despite a very limited exercise capacity so they were taken to surgery to have the valve replaced. The patient had a bioprosthetic valve placed in the normal location for a tricuspid valve. And now the valve does a much better job, almost no regurgitation at all. Let's look at the right ventricle then. Well, it's definitely bigger. That should be a good thing. But how do you think it works? It's not contracting very well at all. The right ventricle of this patient from this example has never really improved, and the patient has ongoing right heart failure despite the valve being replaced. The right ventricle in Epstein anomaly frequently has abnormal myocardial development. This case shows that the Epstein anomaly isn't just a disease of the valve, but that the ventricle is involved too. Here's another patient with Epstein who was sent for valve replacement. There is a bit more right ventricle to work with in this case. After a successful valve replacement at the normal level of the annulus, the right ventricle is bigger here too. The ventricular function also looks pretty good, but look at the base of the ventricular septum. This area used to be atrialized and is now functioning at ventricular pressure. The basal septal motion is quite abnormal, and this is typical following valve replacement in these patients. So assessment of the valve is obviously a priority in Epstein patients. Atrial septal defects are commonly associated and abnormal development of the right ventricle necessitates careful assessment both before and after surgery. So I hope you liked this video. Absolutely make sure to check out the course this video was taken from and to register for a free trial account which will give you access to selected chapters of the course. If you want to learn how MetMastery can help you become a great clinician, make sure to watch the About MetMastery video. So thanks for watching and I hope to see you again soon.